Hi, my name is Christy Shin. I'm the creator of Demon Bitch. And you can find me on uh, Linktree at Horror Tour Studios on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to Rapid Fire. The concept of Rapid Fire is simple. 11 questions, 9 to 15 minutes for the interview itself. And we get to talk with creative and talented people in the entertainment industry. So who is our first guest today? We are joined today by the ever-talented Chris Tishan. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing good. Thank you. It's uh, I've well recovered from two conventions in a row, one WonderCon. So I was flat on my back for that one. Uh, it was really good, though. Very, awesome. very uh, active. Very, very good energy. And I went to Gem State in Boise, Idaho as a special guest. First question. In one sentence, who are you? Christy Shin of Horror Taurus Studios. I'm the creator of Demon Bitch. I write and draw. What is this project all about that's currently on Kickstarter? Story of Demon Bitch. Every year I kind of publish a graphic novel of Demon Bitch. So I ran a Kickstarter to fund the printing, but I also um, make some goodies. There's an Animu Demon charm set of prints by Mary Zorlita Bellamy. She has currently worked on My Little Pony, Quest for Equestria. That's the newest card game by Hasbro. She's also a licensed Marvel illustrator. Also, there's two pins that are enamel designed by Hyde Hermit Studios called Tamabichi, which has glow-in-the-dark expressions. You can either order one or two of them. You can also get from that same group a tiki, a tiki patch and a tiki sticker. We're trying to go and upgrade the, to the hardcover of the book if we hit stretch goals. And also we're working on a computer game. What we're trying to do is do more of a point and click. What it is is that the point of Demon Bitch it's based on a card game type system, not, not any patented one, um, where you accrue points. And the point about Demon Bitch, she wakes up and she immediately needs attention. Since she's an attention whore, she goes online and uh, just finds the worst ways possible. You know, like the hospital selfies where she takes pictures of herself looking piteous of many imagined elements that she has. She looks depressed and always constantly cries about how sad she is and how her life sucks. You know, the typical attention horror stuff, not the actual real issues or problems that people face day by day. And you have to create points or else she dies. And here I thought you just had to buy a Corvette to do that. Well, that was the old days in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> now, 2000s, it's more of like how many times you can go and say, my boyfriend and I were the best ever and we're totally inseparable and everything. I'm like, okay, I can get that for a few, but... You have to do that every single post. There's something going on. And if there's 10 million of them. What is your creative kryptonite? Frustration and exhaustion. I would say if I don't have any more energy doing anything, then I don't do it. So, and, frust and then as a result, I get frustrated because it's like I'm used to prolific in terms of artwork. I realize if I can just rest and relax, then there is no frustration. Sometimes I'll draw something and I'll think it looks like utter shit. And so I'll like say, fuck it. But what I have learned is, is that as I get older, it's like, it's best to just kind of walk away and not deal with it for a little bit. And that way you get to reboot and then you come back in and you're like, oh, okay. It actually looks way better than what I remember. What is the second wisest piece of advice that has stuck with you in your creative career? You got to go and do what you love. Yeah. You're going to have to do some things you don't like or work on some projects you're not very fond of. There, there's a thing of paying your dues. I don't know if anybody's really said to me any piece of advice per se. I've kind of had to learn it on my own. I've had encouragement, but I would say one of the things that I have learned and really fully realized recently is when I would do Demon Bitch, I would have people tell me, oh, you got to leave it alone. You got to just walk away. You shouldn't do anything about it. You shouldn't have anything to do about it. You should just walk away. Don't deal with it, blah, blah, blah. When I would be analyzing the situation, the thing is, when I actually ended up doing the thing that I was, they were telling me not to do, it was kind of funny because they were the very first people that said, wow, you're a really smart person. You're brilliant. It's great that you did this. This is awesome. And I just have to look at them like, okay, you were advising me to do something that you were miserable about. So why should I have listened to you? I tend to listen to some people less and less. Well, you got to find your own path too. That's the ultimate goal. I mean, you, you know, you're the one living the life, not them. Yeah. It's, it's very weird because it's like, you know, you're taught, like, if you don't listen to people, you're an arrogant jerk off, but sometimes really a lot of people, their advice is really not worth much. 
And I'm not trying to say that you should never listen to people, but you should kind of look at that and look at how the person's living. Now, if a person is miserable and they're giving you that advice that they're living, that's generally not a good idea to really follow it. If it feels wrong on a certain inherent level, like in your gut, I would say, or your heart or your gut, either one is good. I wouldn't go with it. If it's just something that you don't want to hear, but it sits right, then I'd say go with it. What career would you choose if you couldn't do what you currently do? Oh, that's really hard. I can't really see myself doing anything other than art or, I mean, a a hard between writing or possibly film. And I don't think I would stray too much of the art thing, maybe act. I think maybe that's what I would do. I would definitely still do the arts. I would probably be in a band. (laughs) I don't think I would do anything really quite, um, really quite what they quote unquote practical, but somehow I've managed to get it done and it works out for me. So Ray, I think it's just maybe I've learned how to trust myself completely on that. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, when I did Personal Monsters and Demon Bitch, I did have some people that thought it was about them. So they got really mad at me. Uh, I think one of them told me I should go get fucked by a blender, which was hilarious. I was thinking, wow, you can't be any more witty. Surprisingly, very, very few people have actually gotten really angry at me about the comics themselves. For the most part, I've had just a lot of people come up to me saying how they just get it. For example, I do have a character named Egg Lady and she's an obese wannabe marathon runner. And the story behind that is that she used to be a lawyer, got disbarred because she took immigrants' money and wouldn't represent them in court. I mean, this is actually a true story of a person that I used to know. I mean, I didn't know them when they got disbarred and I had no idea we were doing that. She was a really fucked up person in general. One of the things is that she got morbidly obese, even though despite she was working out somehow and I thought she was basically sitting there with a gallon of potato chips and that's all she did was like lift them to her mouth all the time. And it was just obviously very fake. For the most part, like 99% of the people that read it, they know I'm not fat shaming people. They're, they know that this is just an asshole character. But I've had one or two people try to come at me and it was actually pretty humorous that they started screaming at me how I actually body shame people. And I started laughing at them online because I was just like, you have no idea. If you've read the actual cartoon, it is not about that, which is hilarious. It's funny because people tend to think, oh, society's dumbed down, society's stupid and they don't get humor anymore. I said, no, actually quite a good number of society gets it all spectrums. It's just that you just have some idiots out there that just want to be especially loud about trying to make it into something that it's not. I have friends that are, would be considered, you know, big or morbidly obese and they think it's funny. That character's funny because they get it. They get it that I'm not insulting anybody just because of their weight. And I've made fun of scrawny people. I've made fun of regular sized people. And it's not really necessarily like I'm focusing on their physical characteristic, but what that person was, like what they looked like to me, what they represented, what they said, you know, it's all one package and people get it. I think people are smarter than what they're given credit for, or they're just taught to not observe so they seem really stupid. But most people are actually, they, they get it. What did you first create that made you realize, yes, I could do this as a career? I think when I created Personal Monsters, that was one of the first books I released. Then I released Sepulchre. Both were received really well. I actually did not expect um, that level of reception. Uh, I thought I was going to be told, oh, yeah, these are really rough and everything. But both of them got really high reviews on a lot of on a lot of fucking comic sites. I was really surprised. And then when I came out with Demon Bitch, Demon Bitch overall got a good review. But it was kind of funny because some people didn't agree with it. And it wasn't like I was being an asshole or anything. Actually, it's funny because if people aren't really into it, or they don't give it a good review. It's funny because I can turn that around and say, well, yeah, fuck, even people don't like her, see why we hate her so much, you know, or something, you know. But it's like, you know, you can take, Demon Bitch is a character that you can take. And even though if life is shitty or if it's not received well, you can actually turn it around and make it successful. Like, look, even this person doesn't fucking like her, you know, all these, and then you can put up all the bad reviews and just laugh at them because it's like, that's the point, you know, but that's the thing demon at this like created demon bitch off of a purse of a few women that i met that were really awful users people like just terrible people and so i just decided to make fun of that and a lot of people get it like i got about 50 50 in terms of men versus women maybe a little more men but mostly like men and women are pretty much an equal ratio they like it 
but that's good though. I mean, you're you're diving deeper into a comic that could be viewed as uh, partly superficial on an initial glance, but there's always a deeper meaning behind creative art. Yeah, it's like uh, I mean, I've said to somebody like, no, I mean, you think that it wouldn't be much because I draw poo poo comics and shit but it actually kind of breaks your head because you just kind of don't give a shit about format or form in the traditional sense. You don't hide yourself behind a certain format or a certain thing, but you still do. It's, it's kind of strange. And when you kind of do it, it kind of opens your brain on exploring different subject matters in different ways. It's very odd. Um, I think that's why I've like got getting into co- underground comics for that very reason. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Oh, that's a hard question. Uh, there's like been a lot of people that I've been exposed to. I was a very gregarious reader as well as a prolific artist. I have a lot of influences from fine art to comic art, and I can't put just one. I would say what kind of started me a little bit on it. Now, I I like the typical Garfield and all that, like the syndicated ones. I would say the far side is pretty good um, in terms of humor and delivery. I actually liked Life in Hell by Matt Groening. So I guess in the two earliest things that I could think that really strongly influenced, influenced me were probably those two cartoonists. Professionally, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I'd say so. I mean, even though I've haven't quite done everything that I said I was going to do or set out to do as of yet, I don't think that that means that I'm not successful already. It's just I'm doing what I love. I'm finally in a place where I'm actually really pretty happy where I'm at. Things are getting better. You know, I'm in a place where I fully accept really good things coming to me. And you know, I, I'd have to say that just overall, I'm just in a place of good, like nothing but good is going to happen to me. You know, I think that's okay to feel. We tend to shit on ourselves or curse ourselves like, well, it can't be good that good all the time. Or like, there's only so much that I can feel good and then I'm going to drop off. And I, I think that's pretty shitty. What I hate is, is like, you don't really want to talk about good things with people because sometimes some people say, well, that's wonderful. That's great. But you know, it can't always be good. Like, why the fuck are you just shitting on everybody's parade? Like, just be happy right now for right now. Like things are fucking good. Yeah. Okay. There are times you're going to go through shit. I've been through my share of shit, but what bothers me is, is that when you're happy and you're chill, it's like, Oh, well, enjoy it. It's not going to last forever. I'm like, you're such an asshole. <laughs> like people really say unknowing asshole things to each other and really they should stop. Like let people enjoy stuff. Like let's say if you're enjoying a Coke, like you're in the middle of enjoying your Coke. You're having a good time. Well, you're going to finish that Coke. Yeah, no shit. At some point I'll finish the Coke, but let me enjoy the fucking Coke. That type of shit. It's like, it's really fucking annoying. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I think sometimes failures, if you do them, it depends on the failure. And I think it depends on how you deal with it. With some failures, like relationships or, you know, money or whatever, you feel like you fucked up because you actually lost something. You you experience a loss, right? Other failures, like you just didn't draw it right and come out right or whatever. And honestly, you could go by probability. That can sometimes determine whether or not you have a successful outcome. But sometimes probability doesn't matter shit because it could be that one break you have out of all these failures you have, kind of take it in context. Like, you know, like, yeah, okay, I applied to X amount of job interviews. I didn't get anything. I'm applying to the 11th. What the fuck was, according to my probability, nobody gives a shit. So why should I expect this to be better? You know, and sometimes it's like, no, it's not about probability. It's just about, it's the right one for you. I think what doesn't make it better is, is that if we blame ourselves for our success, we often confuse that with taking responsibility, which I don't think is really helpful. And sometimes I've had people say like, well, you were too nice or well, you were this. And it's like, that's kind of shitty. You know, that's not helping with a failure. That's kind of really fucked up. But if you just say like, you know, okay, so I did this and this and this factor went wrong and that factor went wrong because of these particular things. It's like when I ask people, okay, so with certain things, what do I have to deal with? 
and they go like, oh, well, it's this, this and this, but you can't do it. It's like, I'm not asking if I can do it. I need to find out everything that I need to figure out or take into account so I can do it. So just tell me, what are all the things that I have to deal with or what do I have to take into account? And guess what? I end up succeeding at it. But you kind of have to just take all factors into things. I mean, I am beginning to actually get tired of the devil's advocate shit because that really doesn't bring an element of helpfulness into it either. It's like, well, you have to look at this fails. Okay, you know what? We're not bringing that. Let's focus on what, getting this done. So what are we looking at that we need to overcome? What situations we need to overcome? What things do we need? To, what objections do we need to override, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? You know, what, are, what is going for us? What is going against us? Okay. And usually when I've employed that mode, I've been very successful with a lot of things. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think, you know, everybody's life story is different. We can study a combinatorics of everybody's life experiences and their thought processes and how they went past or overcame certain things and how they didn't do well or failed. You have to understand that it's your life still. And what these people say is not God's word or word incarnate or whatever, or etched in stone, but you can appreciate what their life is and what they do. And maybe that one type of life experience they have that could be very similar to what you desire, what you want happens. It's kind of one of those things where you kind of have to kind of take it day by day, you know, and you kind of have to read it and take it by situation. And, you know, it's like, well, I want to be like this person because they're this and that. And, you know, I think sometimes people look at the people that are famous, that are very talented, that are not very nice. And you could say, well, okay, but they were successful in this. So what did they do that was successful in that? I don't have to like the person, but at least I can see if I can see if their methodology, if it's not unethical, what did they do to succeed? You know, what little things that I could work to imply in my life, but understand your life is yours. I do hate to say this though, Christy, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, where can we find you and how can we support you online and on social media? And of course, where is the Kickstarter available? Well, the Kickstarter is obviously available on um, the link that I'm providing right there. It's on Demon Bitch, You All Suck. That's the name of the campaign. The book is trying to find, find its triggered and we'll hopefully get that to hardcover if we go past a stretch goal. 7,500. But I also have a link tree, linktreehorrortorstudios.com. That will have links to my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, I believe, and Twitch and YouTube, as well as uh, links to my apparel store and to my print store as well, where I actually sign the existing books and prints. The Kickstarter should have the link up there, uh, as well as my main website. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com, and of course, on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.